it's amazing just how much our our background and our culture and and the arguments that we used to make and the doctrines that we disagreed with and the people that we demonized control so much about how we read the Bible, even when we've made so many radical changes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Danniology. Uh, we are going to be in Romans chapter 2 today, uh, verses 9 through 16. And I want to talk about something that I just learned, and I've looked at this passage hundreds of times. I even did a uh, did a verse-by-verse study of Romans not too long ago, like last summer, and I just, I just missed it. This is so awesome. I've got to share. Okay. <clears throat> First, let me set the context. So, in the Churches of Christ, uh, we are anti-Calvinist. Like, anything that even suggests perseverance of the saints, unconditional election, uh, whatever, we're, we're against it. Now, that being said, we are against, typically, the doctrine of salvation by faith alone through grace alone, you like from Ephesians 2. And in fact, there's a popular uh, book put out by a um, member of the Church of Christ that sold literally, you know, <laughs> literally hundreds of thousands of copies. And the only time it talks about grace is in a negative light, right? So really, really interesting background. But uh, regardless, when we would go to passages to disprove the, the doctrine of faith alone, we would go to passages like James 2, which talks about faith and works. We go to passages like Matthew 7, which says uh, that the one who hears the word and does it is uh, the wise man, and the word, one who hears the word and doesn't do it is the foolish man. Now, one of the questions that comes up when you talk about these sorts of things is, what about people who have never heard the gospel? And one of the arguments that my friend Dallas uh, made, and I thought it was very insightful, is Jesus talks about two classifications of people in Matthew 7. He talks about those who heard the word and performed it, and those who, didn't he- uh, those who did hear the word and didn't perform it. He doesn't talk about those who did not hear the word. But Paul does in Romans 2. The problem is, is that I was so used to using Romans 2 to disprove faith only that I missed what Paul is actually saying here. I get that some of the passages were talking about this, but I didn't see this other correlation that I now see and that I think is just awesome. So let me share this with you. This is Romans 2, 9 through 16. Let me read it. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of mankind who does evil for the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. That is, whoever does evil, there's tribulation and distress for their soul. But for those who do good, there's glory, honor, and peace. Why? Because there is no partiality with God. Now, Jesus said in John 4 that salvation, you know, comes from the Jews, comes to the Jews, right? So uh, we know that the Gentile nations did not have access to the law quite like the Jews did. The Jews did. Let's keep reading, though. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, what about the people who haven't sinned? Now, of course, they've sinned, but have they lived a life of sin? He goes on and he says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When I use this passage, verse, this is what I was talking about, verse 13, I would use it to combat the faith only belief, right? I would say, it's not the hearer of the law. That is, just because you hear it, right? Just because you believe it doesn't count. It's those who do it. So it's not faith only, it's faith plus works. The problem is, is that's not really the argument that he's saying. He's saying in verse 13, it's not the hearer of the law who are righteous before God, but the doer of the law will be justified. That is, there's some people who do the law without hearing it. For some reason, I just never read this passage. This is awesome. This is such a wonderful truth, and I just never saw it. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. It was because I was I used this passage as a proof text to combat you know the badness or whatever. But what he's saying is, is there's people who do the law without hearing it. 
the hearers here are those who obviously hear the law, but the doers aren't those who heard the law and did the law. They were the doers, regardless of whether or not they had heard the law at all. And that's what he says, right, in verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively perform the requirements of the law, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show, in that, they show that the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of mankind through Christ Jesus. So what he says here is <clears throat> people based on their instinct can know what is right and what is wrong. And those who choose what is right, he says, for them there is glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to the people who grew up knowing God their entire lives, but also to those who are outside of the covenant community, who, like Paul, ta- Paul addresses in Acts chapter 17, were simply ignorant. They were simply without knowledge of God. So they had a altar to the unknown God. But see, I always read verses 14 through 16 as a defense of those who had never heard the gospel, but now verse 13 makes it all the more beautiful, putting it within its context of verses 9 through verse 16, make it just so much more beautiful. It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are justified, and you could add on, whether or not they've heard the word or not. Isn't that uh, an interesting passage. So much more beautiful than I ever knew. And I wanted to share that with you in hopes that in hopes that you would be blessed by it as I have. So let's go and talk about uh, for a moment what was the law according to Paul. Obviously he has in mind in this passage the law of Moses. That's the context of uh, chapters 1 through 4, especially dealing with justification in the context of one's access to the law. But let's look a little bit further uh, in the book of Romans to uh, check out chapter 13. Here's what he says. Owe nothing, this is verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the one who instinctively does this will receive glory and honor, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 3. The one who instinctively, even though they never heard the law, even though they, they never heard from God directly what they needed to do, the one who instinctively loves their neighbor as their self fulfills the law. He says in verse 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Yeah, they didn't do the sacrifices. Yeah, they didn't do clean, unclean stuff. But if they love their neighbor, they got it. That's a beautiful concept, and it gives so much peace to people who've never heard the gospel. It gives peace to us about about those who we are concerned with who had never heard the gospel. I grew up believing that if someone had never heard the gospel, they were just lost. No chance at all. But Paul's God is bigger than that. The Jesus whom God reveals is bigger than that. The instinct that we have within us that thinks, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's just. Turns out is correct. And in fact, Paul says in Romans 2 that that instincts, that conscience, uh, if it's not seared, it's is something to be entrusted. He said that they did by instinct things that were within the law. This is a beautiful, a beautiful picture here, and it moves us from the contents of our beliefs to the uh, to to the fruit of our beliefs. I want to read you this passage here from. Uh, this author, whose name is Rachel Held Evans, it's a book that I'm reading at first, and she passed away a few years ago. Just such a tragedy there, but listen to what she says. She says, We are not saved by information. We are saved by restored relationship with God, which might, might look a little different from person to person, culture to culture, and time to time. Above, she says, 
While the Bible teaches that people are justified by faith, it does not stipulate how much a person needs to know about God to be saved. It simply qualifies that the fruit of saving faith is good work. Paul writes that it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. People who have no knowledge of the law but do instinctively the things of the law will be judged not on the basis of how much they know, but on the basis of how they respond to their conscience. Romans chapter 2, 9 through 16. Uh, this little passage here, for those of you who are interested, is uh, in the book Faith Unraveled by Rachel Held Evans. Really interesting book. Uh, it's <coughs> got a lot of things I can resonate with because we have such a similar background. Anyways, that's all. Hope you have a great day. Hope this has blessed you in the way that it has blessed me. And may God continue to bless you in all that you do.